Hello, I'm Bill Hopkins with the Cross Timbers Chapter. We're very pleased to present on our program tonight, Sandy Fountain. Sandy is a, is a member of uh, the uh, North Central Chapter. She lives uh, in uh, Lakeview, which is up in the Northwest part of, uh, of the city, uh, very close to the Fort Worth Nature Center. And Sandy is, uh, uh, She's one of the teachers of our NLCP program. She's going to be teaching a class, uh, you know, level one, coming up in October, I believe, and and I think maybe uh, maybe a level two or a level three class later on. I can't remember for sure. And she's also works with their plant sales there, and she has a great garden, and she's going to tell us about her uh, garden here in just a minute. So okay. And if y'all have questions throughout, you know, please let me know. I'm not good at doing a presentation and monitoring the chat. So somebody just pipe up if anyone has a question. But um, I've been in Tenative since about 2003. Uh, we built our house here and I actually live in Lakeside. You called it Lakeview. That was close. Uh, Lakeside in 1997. And I was lucky. I didn't know anything about planting natives, but I planted all little dwarf yopon hollies kind of around my house. So I kind of lucked out on that. But I kind of got started um, by going to the Lakeside Garden Club. And there I met Suzanne Tuttle and um, Leanne Rosenthal. And they told me about the Master Naturalist Program and, and started talking about native plants and stuff. And so that's kind of how I got going. And then I became a Master Naturalist in 2007 and then joined the Native Plant Society the next year. And so that's kind of been my passion as native plants. And a lot of the pictures I'm gonna show you um, are in my yard, but my yard doesn't always look like this. Believe me, right now with all this heat, it's pretty bad. So <laughs> well, some things are good, but some things are, you know, kind of dormant right now. But um, a lot of you that have been into natives for a while, this is probably gonna be preaching to the choir. But if there's any newbies out there, maybe you can come away with some kind of new information. So why use native plants? Well, for some reason it's so. Oh. Here we go. I don't know how I finally got it to go. All right, whoops. Okay, so one reason to use native plants, and there are a lot of reasons, and we'll kind of touch on some of them here, but they're low maintenance. So um, if you have a lawn, you have to go out and mow it every week, and you have to water it probably twice a week. Uh, native plants, they're easy to grow. They belong in our soils. You don't have to amend the soil or anything. You don't have to use pest control or fertilizer and you just don't have to mow, so it is low maintenance. Also, we have a lot of declining natural habitats. So more and more people are moving to Texas, they're taking up all of the land, they're building houses and apartment complexes and shopping centers and those types of things. And so the pollinators and the birds, you know, they're having issues finding what they need. So if you plant native plants in your yard, you're providing food for wildlife, host plants for butterflies, cover, nesting sites, dens for bunnies, um, and most importantly, stopping off areas to the remaining wildlands. So if everybody started planting native plants in their yard, you know, the birds and the insects and everything would have a lot better chance of finding what they need. Another reason to plant native plants is wildlife viewing. If you like to see butterflies, hummingbirds, birds, other pollinators, bumblebees, lizards, frogs, toads, and other critters, then the more native plants you have, the more things you're gonna see in your yard. Um, and these are just a few things that I'll show you from my yard, a Texas spiny lizard. There's a little gray hair streak on a cow pin daisy. 
Here we've got cedar wax wings and this bird bath, it looks so funny. It looks like it doesn't even have water in it because I broke the top of the bird bath. And so I had to get a new top. And so it's brand new when I took this picture at some years back, but it looks like all of these birds are congregating in the bird bath and there's nothing in it, but it really does have water in it. And I just think it's really neat how the cedar wax wings, when you photograph them, they look like they're velvet. And I took that picture through the window from my house. So there you go, wildlife viewing. And when it's hot, you can just view from your window. And American basket flower on the right, that's one of my favorite wildflowers. And I just thought it was really pretty. The little critter that's on it, it's kind of got a blue abdomen. I don't know if it's a bee or a, most likely maybe a fly. I just thought it looked really pretty. This little guy on the left, this Texas spotted whiptail, I shouldn't say guy, gal, she built, well, she dug out a little area to lay eggs under this little frog pond. And at first, all I saw was her tail, you know, she was working and working and digging it out. And then she turned around, you know, and backed in. And I was sitting on the concrete right next to this. And she was just so tame and she would come out. I, my leg was shading part of the concrete and she came out and got in the shadow of my leg and just like, you know, kind of hung out there. It was, it was pretty neat. And then this guy on the right, Mississippi kite, um, they love to sit on the dead branches up in my oak trees. So if you have dead branches, you know, and they're not going to fall on anything, leave them because the birds like to sit there because they can look around. Um, these Mississippi kites, they sit up there and they look around and then they dive down and get big juicy grasshoppers. Uh, they also like to eat cicadas. And, you know, if you have trees in your yard, cicadas are really loud. And so I'm fine with sharing those with them. One time I saw a bird fly through my yard and it was making this really weird noise. And I thought, what in the world is that? It sounds like a buzzing sound. I didn't know a bird could do that. And then I realized it was one of these Mississippi kites and it had a cicada in its talons and it was making that buzzing sound as it flew through the air. So it was pretty cool. And then he went up on the branch and started eating it. And I was just, you know, on my porch watching that whole thing. So it was pretty neat. Here we've got assassin bugs on the left and skippers on the right on some cow pin daisies. So the more things you have in your yard, and a lot of you know this already, I'm sure, the more cool things you're going to see. Um, oh, I forgot I added this slide. Um, there I've got a red belly woodpecker. I was sitting in the house taking pictures through the window. I did clean the window before I started taking pictures. Um, that helps. Um, and I was taking pictures of this red belly, and I took a whole bunch of pictures. And then later, I was looking back at the pictures, and I'm like, that middle picture there, I'm like, that's not a red belly, that's a northern flicker. And I didn't even notice when I was taking the pictures that that guy had shown up. And then I have lots of little eastern bluebirds that like to hang out in my yard. They love eating all the little caterpillars, little soft spiders, nesting, feeding them to their babies. Sometimes they'll eat the little dried fruit in my bird feeders. If I get a mix that has dried fruit, I've seen them do that. But they love to eat berries, um, beauty berries. Um, oh, what's the other one? Um, pigeon berries. Um, I've seen juncos eat beauty berries, mockingbirds, uh, wrens, chickadees. So the more plants you have in your yard with berries, the more birds you'll get. But one day, the coolest thing happened. I was out in my yard and I was poking around, looking at everything. And I had one of those white um, honeysuckles, the native one that she talked about. I believe it's the Lanacera albiflora. I think that's right. And I saw caterpillars on it. Well, I wasn't wearing my glasses. So I thought, yeah, I got to come back out here with my glasses on because I want to identify these caterpillars and, you know, to see, you know, what caterpillar uses that plant as their host plant. So I went back in the house. I kind of forgot. 
And a couple hours later, I'm like, oh yeah, I need to go look at those caterpillars. So I put my glasses on, I went out there and I started looking and I could not find the caterpillars. They were just gone. So I thought, well, that's really strange. I went back in the house and then I walked into the other room and looked out the window and up in the trees were lots of little Eastern bluebirds. And so they ate the caterpillars and that's okay. I mean, it's, it's the circle of life. Some of the caterpillars make it to moths or butterflies and some get eaten by birds. And I've also seen lizards uh, crawl around on what I call my fake tree that I have a vine growing um, and eating the little Gulf fritillary caterpillars. So it's just, it's just all a balance. Here's a few more things I've seen in my yard. The little goldfinches, you know, we have lots of them all winter long. And then in the spring, when your trees start budding out, well, they leave your bird feeders and they go up in the trees and they eat the little green buds on the trees. And it causes the males to molt and get this really pretty yellow color. And that way they can attract the females for mating. So once they get their, their pretty color, though the bad thing is about 90% of them pretty promptly head north and they go up to Arkansas to my uncle's house. They go up to Maine where my sister lives and they mate up there and about 10% of them will hang around here for a couple of weeks and, you know, you might get to see them before they leave. Um, also, I've had painted buntings. They don't really hang out in my yard all summer but when they first got here in early spring early april when they first came through or probably mid-april i had a couple of males that just hung out and rested in my yard and you know until they were ready to move on i kind of have a tall forest behind my house and painted buntings kind of like more of a scrubby kind of shorter uh, shrubs and things to nest in. So they moved on probably to the Fort Worth Nature Center to, to nest and have their babies. Okay, so that was all the critters you can see if you have native plants, and I'm sure you can see a lot more of that too. Uh, but another reason to plant native plants is because they're pretty. Um, if you have all of this salvia blooming and hummingbirds all over it, you know, because they love the red and the tubular shaped flowers. This is salvia coccinia. I mean, that is just so pretty. And what about beauty berries? The berries on them are just almost otherworldly. They're so pretty. Another reason to plant native plants is water conservation. So, you know, you have to water your lawn a couple times a week. But a lot of the, the plants that grow here, and like this rusty black haw in this picture, they grow in the woods behind my house. A lot of people on my street, well, a few people on my street actually had one growing in their yard when they moved in. Um, they just, that's where they want to be. They're, the soil is right. Everything's right for them, you know, right here where I live. And they've lived here for thousands of years without anyone watering them. So you know, it's a great plant to have unless you're in an extreme drought. You really don't need to water them at all once they're established. And that's true of red buds and uh, Mexican plum, um, Eve's necklace, if I didn't already say that. All of those grow right here in, in you know, Tarrant County. And, and this is what they're used to. So a lot less water. Okay, a few years back, I found this on the internet, and I thought it was interesting, so I kind of adapted some of it for this presentation. Um, it's eight urban legends why some people will not use native plants, and we'll touch on each one of these. So the first one is native plants are messy. So one of my neighbors decided he was going to go native. And so he just stopped mowing his yard and he was going native. Well, something grew in his yard and it grew about a foot and a half tall and it was all over his whole front yard. And guess what it was? It was that um, beggar lice thing, those little fuzzy things that stick to your socks and, and stick to your dog. Well, they're not native. So, you know, if you're lucky enough, 
and you live on a prairie remnant and you stop mowing your yard and the prairie returns, that's pretty awesome. But a lot of times in neighborhoods, you know, they scrape all the topsoil off. And if you just suddenly stop mowing and think you're going native, it doesn't always work that way. But lawn is actually, um, well, native plants are not the absence of landscaping and barren lawn is the absence of landscaping because there's really nothing there. It's like a desert. There's nothing for insects. You know, you're mowing it every week. You're cutting off the little seed heads. I mean, there's really nothing there unless you have a native lawn, you know, like turfalo or, you know, buffalo grass, those types of things, and you don't have to mow it all the time, and it does have seed heads, and it is a host plant for skippers. So, you know, lawn is the absence of landscaping, but you can, you can go native from a non-native yard fairly easily by following these three principles. And you don't have to do it all at once. If you have a small yard, you might be able to, but if you have a really big yard, that would be a lot of work to do it all, you know, at one time. But you can reduce your lawn by 50%, plant densely and in layers, and plant communities instead of single specimens. So if you want to plant salvia gregi, um, don't just plant one salvia gregi, plant three or plant five. Or if you want to plant fall aster, plant three or five. And that way, when they bloom, it just is, looks that much more spectacular. So some people might think this is messy. I think it's quite beautiful. But I mean, there are some perennials that were planted in there. And then there were a lot of wildflower seeds that were kind of tossed around in there. And there's a lot going on. Um, if this is too messy for your neighborhood, if your neighborhood has rules, you don't have to do it this way. You can do it as messy or as neat as you want. This one's a little bit more formal. You've got your nice little pink flowers all, you know, sectioned over there on the right. And you've got your red ones on the left. And, you know, everything's kind of neat and in its place. But if you want to keep it this way, that's going to be a lot of work because native plants kind of tend to move and change, but you could if you wanted to. Um, this one kind of looks formal. It's got a rock border around it, and actually all of the, of the plantings in my yard have rock borders around them. Um, a few up, you know, near the house, I think there's some kind of um, paver type things that we use. Actually, I think we took all of those out. Yeah, I think we did. But I think rocks look best because they look the most natural. And it's amazing. You can create a new garden, do your lasagna gardening thing and get your garden going. You're thinking, oh, what is this going to look like? And, and then you put the rocks around it and it's like magic. It just suddenly looks like a plan, a design. And you can do almost anything within those borders of those rocks and your neighbors are going to think it looks good. So the paradigm, let me see if I can move this out of the way so I can see this. Um, in the past, the paradigm has always been decide where you want to do plantings and fill the rest in with lawn. But what if we break that paradigm and you decide where you want to walk and put the lawn there where you want to walk if you have to have some lawn and then heavily plant everything else and when you do that, you can create outdoor rooms and you can do that one room at a time. So if you have a really big, huge yard, you know, and you can't do it all in one year, you know, just each year create another room. So the lawn and your rock or whatever your border is kind of shape your rooms. So you've got all these rooms here. And actually, these two rooms got joined together. <laughs> and I and uh, some people came to my house one day, and they got out of their car, and they parked on the street. And I was watching them through the window, and they were trying to figure out how to walk up to my front door. And uh, because I had joined these two together, and there was nowhere to walk, and so we ended up putting a path in there so people could walk through. But the trees and the shrubs kind of add structure that become the walls of your rooms. 
and then your ground covers and your mulch become the floor and then the arching branches which you really can't see in this picture become the ceiling and this room actually has a couch <laughs> So legend number two, native plants can't be used formally. So I looked and looked around on the internet and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna find some pictures of some native plants used formally. So here you've got one, two, three senesios right in a row, feather grasses all lined up, yuccas all in a row with a border of lawn around it, you know, salvia gregia is all in a row. So, I mean, you can do that. You can make it look formal if you want to. This one looks more natural, but you know, it's got kind of a path through it, but still things are kind of in their place. These look really formal. You know, you've got these in a row, these in a row, you've got the square structure thing in the middle. This one, I mean, I can't tell for sure if these are all native plants. I see yuccas. Um, this could be a Greg's mist flower here. You know, and it's got concrete all around. It's got this formal concrete little pond in the middle. So you can do formal, you know, with native plants. It'll work. And then legend number three, dense plantings can't be attractive. Well, these are dense. I think they look pretty darn good. This is actually that one I showed you that looked formal. I had all the pink flowers over here and I told you things change and move. Well, these little pink flowers kind of moved around and filled in and other plants have filled in. I've changed some things. It's gotten pretty darn dense in here. This is actually in the same garden, just from a different view. No one in my neighborhood has ever complained about my plantings. I only get compliments. Legend number four, native plants will be destroyed by insects. Well, if you have a balanced ecosystem, then you should have less insect damage. But I mean, we plant passion vine because we want this little gulf fritillary to eat the plant because we want more gulf fritillaries. And plus, you know, they supply food for wasps and lizards and birds and everything. But if you get, say you get aphids on your plant and you spray it with poison, you're not only killing the aphids, but you're killing the, the insects that would eat the aphids, like the ladybugs. And then what if your aphids come back, but then there's no ladybugs to eat them. And so it's even worse. And you just cause everything to get out of balance. So if you just leave it alone and, and let the circle of life happen, the birds, the assassin bugs, the ladybugs, praying mantises, the wasps, they're going to keep everything under control. Here's a, a gulf frutillary eating passion vine. Here's an assassin bug hanging out on my halberd leaf hibiscus, waiting for insects to come along. And this was actually a pot. I had potted up some fall aster and it was just coming up in late winter and it looked like something took a bite out of the leaf. Now, I don't know if it was this guy, this little moth that actually looks like lace. Isn't that just so pretty? Um, if I play, if I sprayed poison when I saw this bite on here, then I wouldn't have this little butterfly. Legend number five, native plants are not as pretty as non-natives. Well, you know, not all of them are real big and huge and showy, but some of them are just really pretty. I mean, this is like Pepto-Bismol pink. It's like a little miniature hibiscus, you know, and like I said earlier, beauty berries. I mean, you just can't beat the color of these berries. They're just spectacular. There are a lot of really pretty native plants. Here's some more of them. Here we've got fall asters all blooming. Um, my neighbor one time knocked on my door and my asters in the front yard were blooming like this. And she said, I wanted to ask you what kind of mums you had. And I said, mums? I said, I don't have any mums. She's like, yeah, those purple mums. And I said, those aren't mums. Those are, you know, Texas native fall asters. And she's like, oh, you know, and blue bonnets. I mean, blue bonnets are spectacular. 
Salvia Gregi it comes in so many different colors. And look at this redbud tree. This was actually growing in my dad's yard and it was just spectacular that year. And this little clematis here, this kind of has to be enjoyed up close. From a distance, they just kind of fade in the background. You don't notice them, but up close, they are just the coolest looking flowers. It's also called leather flower. It kind of feels like leather when you touch it. And I love to sit there and watch bumblebees crawl up inside of these clematises. It's just really neat. One time one crawled up inside and I guess the flower was getting old. They do last for days and it just kind of busted apart. It just kind of exploded. It was really cool. Um, a lot of my uh, relatives that live in Arkansas, my dad's family, they love growing that non-native clematis vine that has the little flat purple flowers all over it. And they're always showing me pictures of it and everything. Whenever they do, I say, oh, I have clematis too. And here it is, you know, and they're like, oh, wow. And this actually is native in Arkansas too, I believe. Legend number six, native landscapes will be scorned by your neighbors. Um, you know, depending on your neighborhood, if you have an HOA, you know, you can, you can do it. You can make them neat. If, if your HOA makes you trim things, you can, you can trim it instead of leaving it for the birds and things to eat the seeds. You can take those trimmings and put them in your backyard and make a little pile so the birds can find them there. You know, you, you can find a way to do it. Legend number seven, native plants attract vermin such as snakes. Well, yeah, we do have copperheads in our neighborhood some years, not every year. Um, you know, a few years back, we had quite a few, but you just have to use common sense. Don't step in three foot tall Greg's Miss Flower, you know, without boots on. Just use common sense and, you know, always watch and, um and it was interesting, I kind of looked on the web for how many people die from snake bites in the U.S., and it said on average five Americans die from snake bites each year, which for the whole United States and all the millions of people that live there, that's not very many. And it said more people die from toasters, chairs, and the common cold. So I thought that was, you know, pretty funny. Um, here's some of my vermin in my yard. <laughs> this little animal, he was sleeping. He was so tiny because this is actually blue mist flower leaves. And these leaves are only, what, about an inch and a half long. He was just itty bitty tiny. His little tail kind of went, but he was sleeping just on top. And I was like, boy, you better move because a bird's going to come along and snatch you up and gobble you up. Um, and here's a, a garden spider. Um, so some vermin's pretty nice. And then legend number eight, native plants are too expensive. Well, if you go to Weston Gardens, maybe you're going to pay $12 for a gallon perennial that's native, but that will last you for years and most likely it'll spread and you'll get new ones and, you know, from just planting that one plant. If you come to the Native Plant Society plant sales, you can get a gallon for $8. I mean, but lawns, if you think about it, all that water you have to put on them and you have to have fuel for your lawnmower and depending on what kind of lawn, maybe you have to fertilize it. And native plants, you know, all you have to do is trim them once a year, um, maybe mulch them, you know, every few years, put a little compost. You can make your own compost even. Um, and native plants, like trees, they shade your house, which reduces your air conditioning costs. I have, in my three-quarter acre yard, I think I have like 80 trees. and I love my trees. Um, and native plants have evolved here and they've survived here for thousands of years and for thousands of years, you know, the insects and birds, that's what they've needed. You know, that's what belongs. A few more of my plants in my yard. This actually, this gay feather, it looks like a bush. Um, a lot of times my gay feathers get so long and 
lanky and lay all over the ground by the time they bloom. Well, this time in early June, I cut it back and it branched out and grew like a bush, which was I thought really neat. If you do that, I would do it by the first of June because if you don't, you know, you might be cutting off the blooms. Uh, some years, my Eve's necklace flowers are really big and, you know, draped kind of like wisteria. Some years, you know, it gets hot too soon and it makes them really small or they don't last as long. But boy, when they're blooming, uh, bees just absolutely love them, especially bumblebees. And of course, American basket flowers. Okay, so that is the program that I was going to talk about. But I also wanted to talk to y'all about um, NLCP. A lot of you may have heard about it, or maybe even some of you have already taken the classes, but it's the Native Landscape Certification Program, and it's governed by the Native Plant Society of Texas. Um, Bill Hopkins and I are actually on the steering committee for the state for NLCP. But it offers uh, four classes, level one through level four, um, introduction to natives, uh, you know, a lot about why you should plant them and a lot of the science behind it and everything. Level two is landscape design with native plants. Level three is installation and maintenance of native, native plants. And level four, which just came out last year, um, is stewardship of native plants. So once you take level one, then you can take the rest of the levels in any order that you want. And we also have another bird class that's kind of a sister class um, to these classes. So you can get different types of certifications uh, when you take the classes. So if you take, say you take level one, um, there is a test. And if you take the test and you pass it, then you get a certificate. So you're certified for um, native plants, level one. If you take level one and level three, then you get, you not only get the certificate for passing level one and three if you take the test, but you also get, certi you're certified in maintenance level. So you have a maintenance level certification. If you take all four classes, take all four tests, then you are NLCP certified. So what you can do with these certificates, these certifications, um, you can post them on your business cards, you can put them on your resumes, you can use them in advertising if you own a nursery. Um, you know, they give you bragging rights. Um, also, when you take NLCP classes, if you're in a program where you need continuing education credits, you can get that from taking the classes. And also, if you you know, get certified in any one of, if you take level one, you take the test, you pass it, you can be an instructor for level one if you would like to do that. And we just um, posted um, all of our classes for the fall. So I'm going to take you to the website. This is the website. It's nipsot.org, which is a state website, slash WP, slash NLCP. So I'm going to take you there. And so here are all the classes that you can register for. And I believe, I think level one is $45 for everyone. And I think the rest of the levels are $55 unless you're a NIPSOC member. And I think it's $45. But if you, when you click on these to register, it should show you. But these are the classes that are being offered. San Antonio chapter, um, you know, Dallas. Our chapter, that well, the chapter that I'm in is the North Central chapter. So we just put Tarrant County so people would know. So on 10-8, we're going to do level one, introduction to natives. So if you wanted to register, you can click on that and uh, get some more information and, and tells you who the instructors are and, you know, how much it is, that type of thing. Sandy? Uh huh. The um, the website's not coming up. I still see your program. Oh, oh. Okay, let me fix that right quick. Thank you, Suzanne. Let's see. It's this one. Okay, so let me go back. 
Okay, so when you first click on that link, this you get the whole Native Landscape Certification Program website, and it shows all the classes that are offered. So here, um, here's Tarrant County or Dallas. We're actually, the Dallas chapter and the North Central Texas chapter, we do a lot of the classes together because we do what we call hybrid classes. So the first day, which is a Saturday, we do everything on Zoom. And so we do that together and we can have, you know, quite a few people, like maybe we could, we allow, I believe, 40 people for each chapter to sign up. So that would be 80 people on the Zoom class. And then the second day of the class, the plant, which is a plant walk, well, the people that signed up with Tarrant County, they go to the Tarrant County location, and then the Dallas people go to their plant walk in Dallas. So it works out really nice. Um, we're also doing uh, Collin County, which is uh, north of Dallas. They're doing the bird class. Um, they're teaching the whole thing on Zoom. We're also, you can sign up with Tarrant County or Dallas. And then, so you can take the bird class with Collin County, but then the, the actual plant walk will be in Tarrant County. So that works out pretty good. We're doing like a three chapter conglomeration here. But if you want to, you know, click on it and get more information and then you can register. And I believe that is everything, Bill, unless anyone has any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sandy. That's really great. 